the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, interleaved road wheels. Special, a tour to the sea floor. And Metal Beasts, the winner of the High Precision Assault Triathlon. Assault is a tough challenge in top-ranking battles. Everything becomes an issue from your own plane with its ludicrous speed that leaves no room for aiming errors to modern SAMs that can lock onto targets in seconds and launch a missile from miles away. However, today's guest is among those who feel excellent even in these tough environments. Please welcome the A7E Corsair II, an American multi-role carrier-based attack aircraft. This plane is propelled by a turbojet engine. The center of the fuselage and the space between the wing spars are occupied by self-sealing fuel tanks. The nose hides a radar. And right behind the cockpit, we see a built-in 20mm autocannon. Survivability is ensured by numerous steel sheets. We see a whole range of suspended armament, unguided bombs and rockets, two types of gun pods, air-to-air -air missiles, and most importantly, the new guided TV seeker bombs, the AGM-62A. Corsair II may find it hard trying to compete with pure fighter aircraft in air battles. Even its air spawn doesn't help its subpar thrust-to-weight ratio. Unsurprisingly, its maneuverability is pretty low as well. Frontal attacks are your only hope, but that's where the A7 truly shines. It has a Vulcan and two more autocannons, which together create such a thick wave of bullets that dodging becomes almost impossible. Of course, taking gun pods will further reduce your flight performance, but <laughs> you've got nothing to lose anyway, right? Might as well take a couple of sidewinders. We recommend going for modification G. It does have less explosives compared to the D modification, but its homing device's field of view is much wider. Moreover, it can work together with the plane's radar, which reduces target lock time significantly. So, how does it perform in mixed battles? Now, isn't the Corsair a true hunter here? First, there's a wide range of great unguided weapons available, but it's pretty straightforward to use. The guided bombs, however, deserve a separate mention, especially in tandem with the thermal visor-equipped pod. Once you spawn, get to around 7 kilometers of altitude and turn aside a bit so that you keep around 15 kilometers of distance between you and the enemy spawn points. That's where lazy anti-air drivers usually idle. Find a target with your thermals, lock onto a point next to it, drop the bomb, and make a tight turn right away so that you stay outside enemy missile range. Most of the time, the bomb will be targeting that point on the ground. But at three to four kilometers, it can lock onto any target it sees automatically. Once you're out of bombs for those long distance calls, get back, reload, and repeat. Grey colours, square shapes, and interleaved road wheels. German tanks were unmistakable. Their appearance wasn't subdued to a national lookbook. It was a calculated engineering approach where every detail had a purpose. And today, we'd like to talk about one of the most recognisable things in German tanks, the interleaved road wheels. Now, why did they use them in the first place? There's a pretty widespread idea that German engineers used the interleaved design for the benefit of softer riding, since German tanks had no stabilizers back then. In fact, it's not exactly true. 
The interleaved design does not ensure a softer ride per se. For instance, the Jagd Tiger with the Porsche chassis was still pretty rough to ride because of its hard suspension and a flawed track design, and nothing about its road wheels could fix that. Of course, the Germans were concerned with how smooth their tanks were driving, so many of their machines had hydraulic shock absorbers. Basically, it's the shock absorbers that do most of the stabilizing part. The interleaved design was there to solve another issue. During the late 1930s, German engineers wanted to drastically improve their machine's mobility. Early Panzer III tanks had a maximum speed of only 35 kph, while the newest Panzer III-E could go beyond 60, and that speed revealed how short the life of road wheels was. The rubber lining on them would overheat and simply melt off. What could they do about this? Maybe increase the diameter of the wheels? But that would mean a reduction in their number. Or would it? If you make them overlap, you can keep the number of road wheels on a vehicle. So let's see. Bigger diameter? Check. Same numbers? Check. That's a win-win. As it later turned out, this design had even more benefits. Thanks to overlapping road wheels, the load on the track was spread much better. And here's an example of why this is so important. The M4A3 was much lighter than the Panther, and therefore its specific ground pressure was lower. But in Normandy, the Sherman had a footprint almost three times deeper. Meanwhile, the rubber lining on heavier tanks like the Tiger wouldn't even be able to hold the weight without interleaved wheels. Still, as is often the case in engineering, solving one problem creates another. Such a design was pretty complicated and pretty tricky to repair. Imagine how much effort the servicemen needed to get to the rubber on the inner line of wheels. That basically meant disassembling half of the chassis. So, to simplify maintenance, the Germans later switched to sturdier road wheels with internal absorption and a different design. By the way, the Germans weren't the only ones having issues with their chassis. The low durability of the rubber was a constant pain for the American vehicles throughout the war, while British and Soviet heavy tanks had steel-lined road wheels. So, much like we said earlier, the Germans just replaced one issue with another. The French too tried going their way after the war, but had little success, so the interleaved design became history. And now, friends, let's go to the sea. The Aral Sea. <laughs> or oh, rather, what's left of it. A dry, lifeless terrain full of shabby village houses, abandoned docks, rusting bulkers and fissures, and a single half-ruined ghost town will become the place of many fearsome tank battles. But eh, first things first. Let's start our tour with the western part of the map around point A. Both teams' spawn points are hidden behind ships that provide a safer route to the center of the map. The capture zone is situated in a village that has almost been reclaimed by nature. Many structures here are roof deep in sand, so finding good cover among them is going to be tough. The capture area itself doesn't provide much cover either, just a few shallow depression areas and a wooden house. Some brick ruins are found nearby, though, and that's a perfect ambush for a tiny machine that could squeeze in. There's some opportunity for medium-range fights. The western part of the map is full of boulders and old ships, but still provides enough lines of sight to catch an enemy in your aims. Now, the center of the map is an old Soviet city with a straightforward design. Dilapidated panel housing, grocery stores, asphalted streets with concrete lampposts, dry trees, abandoned vehicles, and even building cranes. 
a sad picture. But nonetheless, it's an urban environment with close-range fights to expect. Central areas are the ones where you need to be extra careful. There's almost no hiding here, and you can expect an attack from any direction. That's where point B is located. And the only way to capture it is destroy all enemies in its vicinity. Moving east, we find ourselves in an open alley with some railway tracks nearby. These cross the map north to south. It's perfect for an aggressive flank attack, but only before slower, heavier armed enemies get here. Once they're in, it's Squid Game Episode 1, only there's no green light. Finally, there's point C, found in a low area in the eastern part of the map. It's a hilly place that used to be the sea floor. The remains of giant ships stranded here are a good reminder, and a good hiding spot if you're about to be bombed. Fights in this location are likely to be medium and long range. Getting to the capture area, however, might become a hassle. It's situated in the lowest point, and the only cover here is a crane. It used to be a floating one, but now it's pretty deep in the soil. Well, thank you for taking part in our tour. Did you find any good positions yourself? Share in the comments. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Gabriel Bilchowski. Can you guys do a Metal Beasts video on the Jaguar? Hello, Gabriel. It's a great idea, thank you. The latest update just added a new Jaguar. See it soon on the shooting range. Gaurav Sharma writes, How do I use drops, like those drop boxes which need keys? Hi, Gaurav. You can find keys to them on the War Thunder Marketplace. Another question comes from Inej Latinek de Bilia. How do I activate flares on AV-8A Harrier? Hi there. You can find the key binds for countermeasures next to bombs and missiles in the secondary weapon menu. The Walking Spaghetti Monster asks, Tips? Good vehicles on grinding out the Swedish tech tree? Hey, Walking Spaghetti Monster! Our channel has a special series answering such questions called Climbing the Ranks, where we share some advice on the best vehicles in each tech tree. The Swedish video is still relevant, so make sure you check it out. And the last comment for today was written by Stickman Blubbles. Which subsonic aircraft can reach Mach 1 in a dive? Hi, Stickman! Quite a lot of aircraft can do that, in fact, such as the F-3H Demon or today's Metal Beast, the A-7. That's it for today, folks. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. I say this every week, but a lot of you don't. Don't forget to look out for Aral Sea sandworms. We heard they're especially vicious. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and we'll see you next week.